Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of the Thoughtful Solutions Podcast. I am your host, Matt. And I'm your co-host, Chris. And we wanted to start off today's episode with a bit of a preamble to give a context to why we're doing the podcast and a bit of background into these further discussions. So, Chris, why oh, don't yeah. you go ahead and lean into that a bit? Yeah, and what what we mean by that is talking a little bit about who we are. And so I'm Chris, like I said, um, I'm pretty fresh to all of these thoughts that we're talking to, going to be talking about. I've only been learning these things for a pretty short time now, and I'm just now starting to take these these thoughts and see how these systems work and see what I can do to to try and change my... It's really about changing my mind itself from the ground up, but we can get into that later. This, Matt, is a buddy of mine. We've been friends for over well over a decade, met back in middle school as young as we've been through schooling together, we've lived together, we've had jobs together. It's been quite a long buildup and these experiences that we've had have given us a decent amount of, I would say, I don't know, experience, just how the world works. I mean, we've been through it and been talking about it. We've all, all of the above. He himself, well, Matt, I can let you tell a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I've, I'm familiar with these topics as I've been exposed to them since I was about 18 years old. So I'm coming on relatively a decade thinking about this train of thought and really looking at the socioeconomic system and its importance to human societal organization and how it is such a big system that envelops our current paradigm and how we, we really function amongst each other and uh, on the planet as a whole. So with mm-hmm. us talking about these topics, it's very much an introduction of an overall train of thought to help not only bring others into the discussion, as I hope that you guys have absorbed throughout as the first episode, what we're doing here and in future episodes, but to also show how we as friends have talked about these subjects and how we can have this be a vehicle to help, again, further these ideas and just extend the conversation and to really bring a different perspective to a lot of these subjects that are very important and are rarely talked about on a, on a greater level. So mm-hmm. as another note, we are going to be obviously mentioning a lot about free market capitalism. That is, that is the main socioeconomic system that runs the entirety of our species and the planet. And while it may seem to some that we are coming at it from sort of a demonization standpoint, I want to make sure that that is not the case. It's not that free market capitalism didn't work to a degree in the past and that it hasn't gotten us to where we are today. But the main crux of why we're doing this podcast is to show how free market capitalism is very much an antiquated system. It's old. It hasn't kept up with our technical and scientific advancements as Mm -hmm. we have gone and very much into our modern age, but as we have gone through time. And there's a good analogy that I had talked to my friend about where he had mentioned that we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to replace the spoke on it to, to help fix the wheel to keep it going. Whereas we, we're, we're beyond the wheel. We have the capacity for magnetic levitation technology, maglev. So we, we can just blow the efficiency of the wheel out of the water. And we are at that technical point, but society and our economic system is very much still in that wheel mindset where it's, it's again, trying to take an outside, out-system view to really show what our potentials are and to help further that societal and economic advancement. Exactly. This isn't about, again, like you said, demonizing capitalism, but you need to take yourself aside out of the picture, look at all of the systems that have been presented, and they they all have pitfalls. They all have broken parts that haven't been accounted for. One we're going to be focused on, capitalism. It has regulators that aren't working well enough as they should it has um what's the matt if you could again the uh ashby's law it's not following ashby's law right that's the regulators i'm um externalities actually correct the yeah I'm yeah externalities for. are another externalities factor well. that aren't going anyway um and it's the biggest system that we're living in so that's one we're going to focus on but 
not to not to just try and take it down. Of course, not trying to take it down or anything. We want to make a whole new system. We want we want to be able to have an option C or an option D of a new system that takes maybe some aspects from capitalism, maybe some aspects from something else, but from the ground up needs to take into account so much more. It's a it's a perspective and a train of thought that isn't malicious. It isn't meant to to offend or or make someone think that we're on a side we're trying to create a a new one is really the goal correct and it's again about trying to create a conversation as well and as we get deeper into the episodes and the progression of this podcast we're going to get more into the solutions aspect and as we complete this fundamentals playlist to help give a good foundation for these conversations we'll very much get into what some of those viable alternatives might look like. And another note, yeah, another note as well is these topics are very much human centric. It's all about, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all about elevating the quality of life of the majority, if not everybody on the planet, as opposed to what it is now. We are very much Mm -hmm. aware that there are a very few set amount of people and a percentage of the global population that have very much a a, a big piece of the pie, as you will, where 90% of the rest of the world is in the middle and lower class and is is squabbling for the crumbs, uh, for lack of a better word. So it's, it's about increasing the quality of life, giving people access to resources that they don't have to, uh, that they don't have current access to, and to really just elevate the human experience and to bring everybody to a level playing field. Because unfortunately, it hasn't been that way for a long time. And it's very much, uh, we have the technical capacity to make that the, the reality. But with the society and our economic system lagging behind, those things are still part of the antiquated system. So this is a very much a human-centric discussion. And without that aspect, there, there's no real reason to even start these kind of conversations. Right. And like we had mentioned before in the first episode with Stafford Beer's uh, systems and his levels to what he was trying to create, people, the the population, the people themselves were the most important input yep. in the level. It was It was all of the information coming from the individuals and the masses that would change and, and start to uh, put new inputs into the system so that it could keep functioning, keep uh, cycling things through the entire, it's supposed to be a cycle. So from the, from the bottom up is with you, me, and Matt, the people actually creating the system. Correct. As opposed to some top-down measure, which is very much uh, another element of the paradigm that we're in. But today's discussion, to get back to the crux, that's going to end the, the little preamble here. Today's topic is going to be talking about positive and negative feedback loops and their importance to this train of thought as well as environmental destabilization and that being a very large contributor for the the need to talk about these subjects so starting with positive and negative feedback loops why don't you go ahead and uh well, start that off chris well i actually thought um to to start to simplify easiest i want to tell you i I don't know if i even told you this yet matt and i'm probably going to say what it's not what you shouldn't think of first sure um positive and negative don't think of positive and negative as good or bad that will you'll start to confuse yourself and don't think of positive and negative also as having anything to do with integers and numbers and math not that type of positive and negative either so this positive and negative feedback loops i'll start with um the positive one it's about accelerating an input that gets put into a system all, all on its own and making more of that input. So an example, I'll give you, I'll give you an example first. Um, this one, by the way, I did not come up with on my own. I'll have to give credit. I stole it straight from YouTube. But think of an apple tree and one apple ripening, the process of getting sweeter so that it attracts things to come eat it. Well, when that happens, it gets a chemical, a chemical gets excreted from this apple that other apples actually pick up on, and then they start the same process. They start to ripen. And then once one starts from one apple, goes to the ones around it, and then you can imagine the exponential 
rate that that starts to grow at. And it seems like one apple it ripens and then the whole tree is ripe. That's exactly what happens. That is an example of a positive feedback loop. It's the input would be one apple ripening. And then the cause that that has would be all the apples around it also ripening because of the chemical it excretes. So, oh, yeah, and, and I would say another example as well is uh, underwater methane vents. So relative to the environmental crisis that is currently going on in the midst, as the planet heats up due to our greenhouse gas emissions, we all know that the polar ice caps are decreasing and the amount of coverage that they have. There are underground vents, as a lot of people might know, that upstream nutrients and various gaseous, uh, gaseous compounds into our atmosphere and into the, the ocean bodies. And a lot of these vents uh, spew methane as one of their main excretions. And as the ice mass begins to decrease due to the increase in global temperatures, these are going to further uncover these underwater methane vents. And again, as a lot of people might know, methane is the most, you could say, effective greenhouse gas in terms of its ability to actually contribute to the greenhouse gas footprint. And as more methane gets input into the atmosphere and into our environmental systems, that's further going to heat up the planet, which is going to melt more ice caps. And that is another example of a positive feedback loop. You can also look at like tundras as well in Siberia and northern Canada, areas like that. Those also have methane vents. And as that permafrost starts to be depleted as well, that's going to expose these vents and allow them to excrete their gases at ever increasing rates. Exactly. So the input would be temperatures increasing, ice melting, causing even more hot temperatures from these vents to be exposed, and the cycle is exponentially increasing itself. The feed, the, the loop is making itself grow, basically. Yep, so now, why don't you get into the negative the feedback negative, loop? Right, negative feedback loop. So is isn't necessarily the reverse of a positive, but what happens in a negative feedback loop is there's a midpoint that wants to be balanced. And when the system starts to go one direction, a correction will happen to bring it back to that midpoint to could downgrade it. Or if, if the system was going down, it could upgrade it to maintain a midpoint balance. So a good example of this would be maintaining the temperature of your body. We are um, all ectomorphic, we're warm, warm blooded. And we try to maintain, I think it's about 98 degrees Fahrenheit, usually, uh, inner core temperature. And to do this, if you start to heat up, you know, what happens? You'll sweat. Sweat causes evaporation. The evaporation also removes heat as it evaporates, tries to cool you off. Um, that is you, your, your, your midpoint would be the 98 degree temperature. You getting hot and increasing, your body reacting to downgrade that back down by causing sweating. And, and uh, some other ways to um, convection and whatnot. But now let's say hypothetically you cooled off too much and you went down below what you were supposed to be. Well, you're not going to keep going down. Your body's not going to keep that cycle going. It's going to reverse and you'll have effects like chill bumps, which are supposed to tighten your, your hair follicles and tighten your skin and make more of like imagine a shirt becoming tight around you. And it's supposed to keep your hair standing straight up to... Uh, try and hold the most amount of heat around your body. This is your system trying to correct it back up to that midpoint, the 98 degrees. That is a negative feedback loop. Yeah, and having the conversation be relative to system science, as we had mentioned in the first episode, is the big crux of why we thought this would be a very good topic. Positive and negative feedback loops are very much an element of viable system science and a viable mm -hmm. systems model. And having those be a factor in how a system is oriented <laughs> is very much, again, a contributing way in which a system can be designed to function in that capacity. So looking at these things from this, again, system's point of view, very much takes this into account. And it's actually going to feed into the second leg of the discussion when we 
I'll, I'll go ahead and start that now talking about environmental destabilization because a lot of those elements are a mix of positive and negative feedback loops. Unfortunately, most of them being positive, which is, as Chris had described, more of an amplification mechanism. So yeah. there are four main realities when it comes to environmental destabilization. The first one is resource overshoot. Again, as I had mentioned in the first episode, we are using currently about three and a half times the resources that Earth can naturally regenerate in a given year. So we are overshooting the amount of resources that the planet can regenerate in its natural capacities. This is, again, estimated to increase to 2050 by 27 Earths, and it's going to be ever increasing in a business as usual scenario. So resource overshoot is very much an element of environmental destabilization. And this also is in tandem with us breaking the Malthusian trap, another topic that I had mentioned in the first episode, where we hit the Industrial Revolution, the quality of life of your average citizen and uh, person very much increased, but that also started to exponentially increase our ability to affect our environment in a negative way. So resource overshoot is the first element here. Second element is biodiversity loss. As and, and this kind of ties in with the third element as well, which is the sixth great mass extinction. So as we have broken this trap and we've begun to affect the environment in a very negative way, we have seen not only an overall species decrease from what we know uh, in 1970 by 50%. So 50% of all species since 1970 that we have discovered have gone extinct. But we also see ever increasing levels of biodiversity loss which is an element of redundancy that is known in natural systems. The higher levels of biodiversity that ecosystems and lower and higher echelons of natural systems are, they, they are able to deal with catastrophes more in an easy way and are able to very much kind of have a negative feedback loop to help mitigate a lot of the issues that we might be throwing their way. But because the biodiversity is being reduced, this very much has a, a, a down-regulating effect on nature's ability to, to do that. Uh, the last element here is it's, it's important to mention these three, three things because they affect our ability as humans to do the three main things that were required to really live, which is food production, water availability, and drinking water production along with air quality. As biodiversity gets lost and as we re overshoot Earth's resources, topsoil being a, a, big, a big resource here when it comes to food production, we're going to see in our current modes of agriculture a reduction in food output, which as everybody also knows as well, with populations ever increasing as time goes on, this is very much going to have a destabilizing effect. Water quality, mm -hmm. it's estimated that we're going to have wars over water by 2050, and fresh water will very much be a scarce resource as we use more and more up and we pollute the systems that we currently have. It's going to become a scarce resource when in reality we have water all around us and it's our technical capacity to solve that. Last yeah. element is air quality. Uh, China is a very good example. They have 16 out of the 20 most polluted air cities in the world when it comes to air quality and if you can't breathe the air if you can't go outside you're yeah, going to have a lot of <laughs> you have a lot of negative health outcomes breathe, right yeah you can't you can definitely start dwindling in what you could do once the air goes to crap oh yeah that's it's it's very much a bad situation to be in if if you're scared to breathe the air that that we all have access to Right. So those are the main facets of environmental destabilization. And when we're talking about these things, Chris, why don't you elaborate on why food, water, and air are so important and how that feeds into our society and our economy? Right. Well, well to, to kind of tie it back into something we touched on in episode one about our, you know, infinite, uh, infinite consumer problem and also you know you, you slightly kind of mentioned hinted toward it when what you just said about our ever-growing population 
as as we keep on needing to consume or needing to demand an infinite amount of food, I'll just keep, I'll stick to food for one second, and then I'll do water because both are solvable, really. As we keep growing the population and ever growing the infinite demand for food, with these already shown signs of, like you said, losing topsoil, and not just we'll stick to that at the moment, but it's instantly going to lead us farther and farther towards just like economic issues, bigger economic issues. Uh, it'll probably start like, obviously food's going to just get more and more expensive, rarer, harder to find. We'll start possibly seeing less on the shelves. Things were to stay the way that they are. Water, water. That's a crazy one because we do have the technology to work on desalinization. We absolutely have that technology. And also briefly mentioned in the first episode, our, our, cruxes of capitalism the billionaires and whatnot they have the money we have the technology and some people have the money to solve these issues and yeah obviously we start losing water they start losing your lawns start losing plants start then start increasing temperature start uh, being charged more water for from your house at the store just infinite growing problems if we start having harder issues getting water obviously and that very much feeds into not only the environment destabilizing, but as that right. destabilization gets worse, society and our economy, or for lack of a better word, our socioeconomic system begins to destabilize as well, which very much puts a block in the road to any progress that we might make, as once we hit some of these tipping points, it's it's very hard to rectify those things. And as mentioned in, in the preamble, once we start talking about food solutions and just different elements of, of what these uh, alternative systems might look like, it can help very much mitigate these issues. But in our current paradigm, it's a reality that we do have to face. Yep, yep. And this is all, all going to be dived into for sure. Just give us some time. <laughs> <laughs> So this also feeds back into another thing that we had mentioned in the first episode, which is the concept of Ashby's Law, as we had also mentioned in the preamble, mm -hmm. where a lot of the governmental systems, the regulators in this current paradigm not being able to keep up with the levels of externalities and destabilization, as we had just described. And the, these are supposed to be entities that are here to mitigate these things. And while entities like the EPA and the United States might try and push certain climate policies and regulations to help try and reduce these issues, unfortunately, they're stifled at every corner by the business industry trying to make profit and not really caring about the, the polluting aspects that might be a result of, of the business as usual scenarios. So while progress is being made as people do know the consequences of what's going on it's there there's very much a lack of capability in these regulatory systems to really get to the root cause of what is is generating this the, these levels of destabilization of course right now um the incentive the reason that these companies are stifling the the need to to try and control and regulate with like, you know, stifling the EPA and, and whatnot is because the system is solely just incentivized to make profit. Like, I wanted to elaborate on what you were saying about them wanting profit. To, so that's why they're throwing money at yep. stifling it the best they can. The, and it's, it's, again, you know, not to demonize them, but it's, they're, they're just incentivized by what you can do with this system to make profit. And that's what they're going to do to keep making profit. And that's, you know, one issue that we need to, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult, I think, but one issue we need to figure out how to work around, for sure. Yeah, and, and circling back a bit to resource overshoot, there are three main categories of resources that are pretty key to mention here. The first one is naturally regenerating resources. So you can consider certain wildlife populations, plant species, trees, that kind of thing that have set regenerative rates that we're able to measure. And given enough time, they will come back to fruitive levels uh, as, as we give them more time to regenerate. Another type of resource are scarce resources and non-renewable resources. These are very much our 
rare earth minerals, fossil fuels, things that we need to extract out of the earth. But once we get that, it's it's very hard, if if possible at all, to actually create these resources from scratch. And the planet has a set amount of these resources available from the get-go, and it's very much relative to our capacity to recycle and to reuse these resources and to break them down to these component parts to reuse them in, in further technology. Yeah, the, try to at least use them wiser. Oh, God, yeah. That's... <laughs> That's definitely a reality. And the last type of resource is a bit more abstract, but it's it's what I like to call human resources. So that's things like public health metrics, social cohesion, or social capital, which is a fancy word for social trust, and our ability to orient ourselves in a societal fashion to help galvanize these kinds of change. And, and managing all of these types of resources takes different perspectives and different mechanisms, but if they are able to be taken into account and, and managed in a steady state way, we can very much see a development in, in a positive way in changing the paradigm that we're in. Because all of these things, again, as mentioned, are in overshoot capacities. Social cohesion is at an all-time low. There is a lot of interclass friction and a lot of inequality in our current paradigm. And due to that being the case, uh, <laughs> that makes social capital a very scarce resource. Along with public health also essentially being in the toilet at the global level. Uh, and mm -hmm. as, as Chris had pointed out, trying to reuse recyclable resources, which is not part of the economic equation to the extent that it needs to be, all of these things very much show that a shift needs to occur, but it's just about explaining what the train of thought is and what those solutions might look like. And again, galvanizing change behind that. Yep, yep. Exactly. That they well put just discussing it out right there. So, but uh, that's that's really the extent of today's episode was just trying to get out the concept of a positive and negative feedback loop, what they are and their relationship to system science. And not only system science, but you could elaborate it to environmental science and economics, things like that. And talking about environmental destabilization, some of the important aspects of that and how that relates to social and economic destabilization, as well as their importance in resources and how that relates to our current system and how we can start to, to look at these things from a different perspective to try and alleviate these issues. So any, uh, any takeaway? Uh, I think, no, I mean, I have, I'm I pretty I much one. good. What about you, Chris? I did. I did think of one. It seems like just the, the between the positive and negatives of the feedback loops, a better system would be more negative feedback loops. Just, you know, you know, looking at it from the surface, um, positive kind of seems a little out of control. I think negative feedback loops are, you know, more the more that you have, the more recursion with those you can get, the better the system probably is. That's my hypothesis right now. No, that is absolutely correct because we need more of the balancing systems, which the negative feedback mm -hmm. loops are. And when it comes to positive feedback loops, we need to relate that to elements that are not being amplified. We need to amplify public health. We need to amplify social cohesion. We need to amplify oh, environmental okay. steady state principles. And so it's, it's about shifting where the emphasis is and then explaining what those feedback loops might be and having that be a component of creating a viable system. And so, all oh, right, good, everybody. Good yeah, well, thanks for tuning in for the second episode of the Thoughtful Solutions podcast, and we will catch you sometime soon. Have a good one, everybody. Bye.